All right, so here we go, continue talking about surfaces. Um, and in this video, we're gonna now introduce in friction, okay? Friction is a big part of um, Newton's laws because it's the force that slows down objects, okay? So when we did that unit 2.1 uh, set of notes, we had that table, and inside that table, one of the forces we talked about was friction, okay? So one thing to know that it always exists between two surfaces that are in contact with each other, and there is a sliding motion between them, okay? Just like I mentioned before, we're not gonna worry about rolling, right? So in this um, area, um, our focus is going to just be on um, the sliding motion, okay? And one thing to note about friction is that it always opposes the motion, right? So if my motion, if I have an object in motion and I'm going to the right, right? Well, friction acts to the left, okay? It's always um, countering what, uh, what, uh, what the motion wants to do, okay? There are two types of friction. The first one is static friction, which we just abbreviate F sub S, and then there's kinetic friction, which is F sub K. Okay, uh, and let me scroll ahead a little bit here because I didn't realize when I made this document that I didn't define these two frictions until after I mentioned them there. And I go through some other things. Um, so static friction, right, is the friction that objects have to overcome to begin to move, right? So what happens is if you push a couch, you'll feel like that slight little tug before the couch actually begins to move. That little tug is the force that you have now gone past the static friction, okay? So static friction wants to keep objects still, okay, not moving, okay? And then on the other side of it, once you now begin to move, we're now focusing on kinetic friction, okay? Remember, we talk about static, kinetic, dynamic, okay? Remember, static means no motion, okay? Kinetic means motion, all right? And so that there's your difference, right? So static friction wants to create, wants to stay where it is. It doesn't want to move. Kinetic friction, now you're moving, okay? Um, and then this is the friction that you have to overcome to continue moving, okay? So kinetic friction is the reason why cars come to stop when they break. Um, it's when if you're sliding something on a table, that's why it comes to a stop. It's, it's kinetic friction, okay? But one thing to note is that it is easier, I'm sorry, it, yes, it is easier to keep an object moving than it is to start an object, okay? So your, your static friction will always be bigger than your kinetic friction. And I do want to note that when we talk about friction, we're talking about surface-to-surface -surface interaction. So when I make a statement like static friction is always greater than kinetic friction, we're talking about for the same surface-to-surface -surface interaction, okay? If it's different surface-to-surface -surface interactions, then it's not, it, that doesn't hold true, right? Because your, your, your factors are gonna be different, okay? Now, both types of these frictions do have a special quantity or a coefficient associated with it, and that's the coefficient of friction. It's given the symbol mu, right? So it's the Greek, it's the Greek M. It basically, it's just a U with a line off the front, okay? And basically what this value tells you is how easy or hard it is for the object to move on that surface, okay? Um, and then these values are going to be between zero and one. Some go greater than one, but that's like, you know, metal to metal interactions, or if you have like a brick on a brick, there's a potential being um, greater than one, okay? And by me making a statement that you see kind of down in the bottom right-hand corner of Fs is greater than Fk, that means that your static coefficient of friction 
is always greater than your kinetic coefficient of friction. And let me, let me say, right, again, that little caveat for the same surface to surface interactions. Right. If the surfaces are different, yeah, then you're going to have like completely different values for your your coefficients of friction. Okay. Um, easy way to think about you know the difference between the two. Uh, if you're remodeling a bathroom, sometimes people want to put the nice shiny tile on the floor in the shower. Um, that's not good because if you go to a tile store, on the back of a tile box, oftentimes it'll actually list a number that says COF equals point something. Well, now you know what that COF number is. It's the coefficient of friction. So those nice shiny tiles that are actually supposed to be up on the wall, those have low COF numbers, right? So a COF of zero is, is, is frictionless, and that's like ice, right? So if I take a low coefficient of friction number and I add water to the, to the, to the situation, well, I'm putting a slippery material or slippery substance on a slippery surface that's even more slippery now, okay? Um, and so that's why if you look at most shower tile, usually they, or most showers, they use um, the octagon and diamond shape or the octagon and square because for a couple of reasons. One, the material has a low COF number, but the grooves, right, the, the part that's grouted has... Um, it has the uh, it creates more traction, okay. Um, when I was growing up, you know, we had bathtubs that didn't have that were very slippery, so we actually had to go to a store and buy like these stickers that you stuck in the bottom of the bathtub to create that same effect to create the traction that a rubber, okay. And so our feet could be could um, easily walk on that bathtub, um, you know, so we weren't slipping and and you know splitting our heads open, okay. Now. The general formula for, for friction, okay, and this applies to both frictions, okay, so both the static and kinetic friction, is that the friction is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. And I'm going to tell you about 90% of the time, Fn, the normal force, will equal the weight of the material or the object, okay? 90% because there's that just a random case where um, I may put something on top of an initial object, or I may have a force, like the previous in the previous video, we had a question where the force is up and to the right that we were pulling with. Well, that vertical component now factors into our scenario because now we have to account for that if we have friction. Okay, um, so let's do a little pro some problems. These are just some basic questions um, that focus that have that friction focus. Okay, but again. Follow the steps. Draw, sum, solve. Okay. So when you push a one kilo, a one point eight kilogram book resting on a tabletop, a force of two point two five newtons is required to start the book sliding. Once it is now sliding, however, a force of only one point five zero newtons keeps the book moving with a constant speed. And then, what are the coefficients of static and kinetic friction between the book and the tabletop? So notice, like here, these are our surfaces. So we have a book, and we have a tabletop. Right, and so we're trying to find the coefficient of frictions between that book and that tabletop. Okay, and the good thing is when you do these friction problems, oftentimes you only have to draw the free body diagram once. Okay, because it's the same free body diagram, you're just changing subscripts. Okay, so again, we always start with our uh, weight because we have a, an object with mass, so the book has mass, so we have weight. The normal force is going to balance the weight, right? And then we have an applied force that we're pulling with, and then we have friction opposing that motion. Okay, I'm gonna write this as FA, just so we don't like have capital F minus lowercase f running around in there. Okay, so now we're gonna sum the forces. All right, so here's our T chart. Thank you again, Colonel Dinsmore, for this. I don't know if you're ever gonna get a chance to watch these videos, but I mentioned you a lot. Okay, so we got some of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero. Okay, so now we actually have to do the y direction, okay, because we have to account for the vertical aspect because now we have friction. Okay, so now we have Fn minus Fg, whereas in the first two questions I was just doing the, F, the, 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 the vertical direction for practice. Now I'm doing it for 
the problem, okay? And I need to solve this side for a normal force. And it just tells us, here's one of our 90% questions, right? It's normal force equals weight. You can calculate it at this point in time if you want, but remember, AP test may do that algebraic expression. Um, so leave it as is for right now. Maybe that mass cancels out or something. Okay, so now we're going to do the sum of the forces in the x direction. And so um, because we are um, looking at constant speed and so forth, we're going to set the x direction equal to zero. And so I have applied force minus friction force equals zero. And so this is just telling you that the applied force equals the friction force. Okay, and then I'm just going to do algebra now, right? Remember our line of physics math, right? So physics ends after this, after the summing of the forces, and math takes over, okay? And so now I know the friction force is the coefficient of friction times the normal force, but we found with the normal force equal, right? So the normal force we found in the y direction, it's just our weight. And so we're going to say F equals umg okay and we're looking for the coefficient so we're going to solve this for mu and so that's going to be our applied force divided by our weight okay now i'm going to do the actual calculations over here off to the right um just for because I, I ran out of space down there so the static coefficient is going to be the the force we apply to get it to move divided by mg and so that's going to be 2.25 divided by 18 times 10. We're going to use 10 here just for simplicity. Okay. Um, again, on the AP test, do what they tell you to do. If they say use 9.98, use 9.98 because that's what their numbers are going to be based on. Okay. I'm sorry, this should be 1.8, not 18. And so that's going to be a coefficient of 1. Point, or sorry, 0.125. Okay. And so you know, a red flag should go up if when we make this next calculation, if it's greater than 0.125, we've made a mistake. And typically the mistake is you did the right math, you just labeled them incorrectly, right? Okay, so we have uh, 1.50 Newton force keeping it in motion, right, moving at a constant speed. And so we do 1.50 divided by ultimately 18. So 1.50 divided by 18. I get a coefficient of 0 0.083. Okay, so there is my static or kinetic coefficient of friction. Here is my static. And it's perfect because it tells us that mu k or mu s, sorry, I was going to write equal to, is greater than mu k. Okay, and that's, we know that's always true. Okay. All right, so let's go to the next problem. Now, this problem is from a textbook, and this actually originally started as a dynamics problem, but what I did was I was nice, and I didn't treat it as a dynamics problem yet, and I actually give the acceleration. Okay, so someone at the other end of the table asked you to pass the salt, feeling quite dashing. You slide a salt shaker with a mass of 50 grams in that direction. The salt shaker slides in an acceleration of magnitude 0.787 meters per second squared. It comes to a rest at the desired location. What is the co coefficient of kinetic friction between the shaker and the table? Okay. So here's our, guys, follow the steps. Draw some salt, right? So here's our free body diagram. So we got the normal force up. We have the weight down. Okay. And then we have friction to the left. So this, should, this is a, a, a problem where a lot of students want to add an applied force okay the salt shaker is sliding on its own so there is no applied force yes at the beginning of the motion we apply a force to get it to move but we are looking at after that okay down the ways a little bit okay and so we're not worried about that friction or that that applied force that got it to move okay so now we're going to do the sum step. Okay, so x, y, right? And so in the y direction, we have sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero, right? This is very typical of a friction question. Again, that 90%, I would say. 
All right, so we're just going to keep going down. It says Fn equals Fg and Fn equals Mg, right? Typical vertical direction in a friction problem, right? Again, here's our line of physics math, right? Now we do the sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to max. In this case, we just call it A because of the one acceleration. And the only force acting is the friction force. Okay, and it's going to the left, right, because our motion is to the right. We're always going to assume positive direction for the motion, right? So now we're going to, what are we looking for? We're looking for the coefficient. Well, the coefficient is contained in the friction force. So we're going to substitute in what friction is. So negative mu n, mu fn, okay? But again, I found that fn, right, was mg. And so I'm going to plug that in now. So I'm going to negative mu mg equals ma, okay? And now I want to solve this for mu, so it's going to be, um, let me, sorry, so mu equals negative ma over mg. But guess what? It's the same salt shaker, so the mass goes away, okay? Um, and so all we have to do is divide the acceleration that we got, which is 0.787, by g, which is 10, okay? And our coefficient is 0 0.0787, okay? I want to show you, though, real quick, because you can cancel the masses here. And you end up with this kind of equation that looks like A equals negative mu G, okay? You probably will want to memorize this equation because this is the, a sliding object, right, acceleration. As long as there's no applied force, that's how you find the acceleration of a sliding object. And note, there's no mass. Okay, in this equation, right? So a lot of times on, on a question, they won't give you that mass, okay? And a lot of times students are like, but I need the mass, I need the mass. But if you do go through and do the algebra, you find that the mass just canceled out, okay? So from here on out, we're going to do, now we're going to look at inclined planes, okay? So what happens if our surface is no longer horizontal, but it is now inclined like as if it were a ramp? 